House of Ed Tech, Episode 21. This is Teresa Steiger, Principal of St. Mary's Catholic School in Rockwood, Michigan, and you are now listening to the House of Ed Tech with Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download at audibletrial.com slash House of Ed Tech. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing information you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and have them share their stories. The purpose being, whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. Welcome back inside the House of Ed Tech. I'm so glad you're here. This is, as I said, episode number 21, which means episode 26 is fast approaching in the next uh, couple of weeks. So stay tuned at the end of the episode where I can let you know how you can get involved in my big one-year birthday party anniversary celebration for the House of Ed Tech. Coming up in this specific episode, I have a great conversation that I'm going to share with you that I had with Miss Casey Bell, and she is from shakeuplearning.com, and I have my EdTech thought, I have my EdTech recommendations, another installment of the House of EdTech VIP, and a couple of news items that I'd like to share with you before I get to the conversation with Casey. First, some big news between Google and Adobe, if you hadn't heard. Adobe is bringing many of their products to Google Chromebooks, and they are starting with Photoshop. And this is really awesome news because I'm a super huge Photoshop fan. All the graphics on my site, graphics that I do for other people, uh, a lot of podcast cover art, and I mean, you name it, I'll try to do it in Photoshop. I am a huge Photoshop nerd, junkie, fanboy, whatever term you want to use about being excited and celebrating software, that's me about Photoshop. What you need to check out for more information, uh, and I got this from googleforeducation.blogspot.com, and this is the Google for Education blog, and the headline simply reads, Adobe joins the Chromebook party starting with Photoshop. And one sentence that says it all inside this post, quote, this streaming version of Photoshop is designed to run straight from the cloud to your Chromebook. It's always up to date and fully integrated with Google Drive. So there's no need to download and re-upload files. Just save your art directly from Photoshop to the cloud. End quote. And begin the excitement that I may now give really serious consideration to getting a Chromebook. Because that's the one, Photoshop is one of the main reasons I still have my Windows PC. So this is very exciting news. And if you couldn't tell, I am very excited about this new opportunity to, to use Photoshop on a Chromebook. This, this is super cool. I'm very, very happy. What else is going on? It is the middle of October. And October, if you didn't know, and you probably should know since you're listening to a podcast and you're probably on Twitter, October is Connected Educator Month. Basically, what is Connected Educator Month? First, the main resource, you can check out connecteducators.org, and they have a calendar and all these events and resources about what you can do to celebrate or encourage being a connected educator, specifically here in the month of October. And I preface this by saying being connected is something that obviously we shouldn't just be celebrating one month out of the year. It's kind of like you know loving your wife, partner, girlfriend, don't just wait for Valentine's Day. Celebrate them all year round. And if you're a connected educator, celebrate the idea of being connected all the time. This month, I'm committed to really initiating those conversations. And more than ever than I normally do, I want to teach people about what it is to be connected. And really, the goals of Connected Educator Month include simply getting more educators to be proficient with social media to improve their practice and their learning and helping schools integrate connected learning into their formal professional development efforts, and to simply stimulate and support innovation in the field of education. Head over to connecteducators.org, click on the calendar, 
it's not too late. There's still half a month left, depending on when you listen to this, to find some events that you may be able to get to in person or participate in online for Connected Educator Month. And the last thing I'd like to tell you about before we get to my conversation with Casey Bell is I have changed my website. If you haven't been there in a couple of days or weeks, uh, my website again is mr.chrisnessy.com. It's built on Blogger, and now it's got a whole brand new theme that I'm really excited about. I've brightened it up. I have put an actual picture of me out there, and that's actually something I'm going to start to be doing more of. So I have some mixed feelings about it because I've been using the Mad Men avatar for a number of years now. I, I, I don't even know. But my wife, Caitlin, who was previously on the, uh, on the podcast, she's also a photographer, and she took some great pictures of me in my only suit before a wedding a couple of weeks ago. And I'm really excited that I'm going to be using pictures of me now. Also gone from the site is the name Education the Nessie Way. And that's also a little sad because when I first started my site back in 2008 as a long-term sub in a social studies classroom, I came up with the site name History the Nessie Way. And when I transitioned out of social studies and into my new role and wanted to focus more on professional development and teaching teachers with what I do online, I just I just changed history to education. And now the site is simply just called Mr. .chrisnessy.com and really just highlights the main keywords about me, which are the fact that I am a husband, a father, an educator, a podcaster, and a speaker. So check out the new site. I'd love to get your feedback. Hit me up on Twitter, uh, Voxer, and all that information comes at you at the end of the episode. And you can also just leave some comments on the show notes for this episode, number 21. So enough rambling out of me. Let's get to my conversation with my guest, Miss Casey Bell from shakeuplearning.com. Casey Bell is a digital learning consultant and a proud graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and Texas State University San Marcos with a master's degree in educational technology, and she provides educational staff development for all levels of educators. She is a certified Google education trainer, and she has presented at such conferences as TCEA, the Texas Google Summit, and iPad Palooza. Casey is also an EdCamp Awesome organizer and a proponent of the unconference concept. She believes in finding alternative ways to deliver professional development and differentiating for teachers. Casey is also the maintainer of the blog, shakeuplearning.com, and she has been recognized as a must-read EdTech blog for 2014, and she is a go-to resource for Google tips and tricks. As a blogger, Casey uses her blog to create and curate resources for teachers of all levels. Casey is passionate about technology and increasing student learning, and she helps teachers fa facilitate and use digital tools. Welcome to the House of EdTech, Casey. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. It, I am, again, as I, before we started with the actual conversation, thank you so much for taking time. I really appreciate it because, I, again, I know you're very busy. No problem. I'm happy we could fit it in. Cool. What attracted you to a career in education as well as devoting your time and energy to technology integration? Well, you know, um, I think I became an educator because of the same reasons that a lot of people go into education. Um, I love kids. I, I absolutely love working with kids. And, um, I, you know, I just thought it was something that I would enjoy. I learned very quickly <laughs> after um, graduating <laughs> that, um, you know, choosing a career that you're passionate about makes a big difference and is way more important than making a lot of money. So, um, you know, I, uh, I decided to pursue my certification post back and, um, went into education. I was a middle school language arts teacher for a little while and then, um, sort of found my niche in technology. I have always been attracted to technology. My parents have a, an electronics company. And so I've, I've grown up around a lot of different types of technology and just um, found that it, it came easy to me. And so um, it just fit naturally with um, teaching and helping people. And so I wanted to make a bigger impact 
than just in my classroom and help make a, a larger impact in several classrooms. I'm in the same boat currently. Um, I, I've taught middle school and I currently work in a high school, but I, I'd like to do what you do, which is, you know, be a, almost like a full-time, full-time presenter and, you know, really get the opportunity to work with teachers. And I get to do that a little bit in my school right now, but I, I definitely see myself going down the same road you are. Yeah, I really enjoy it. I do miss working with students and any chance that I get, you know, to, to be invited back into the classroom, I definitely try to take advantage of. That's, that's definitely one of my goals as well, because I, I do like kids. Um, and as a facilitator, I, I would definitely make it part of my goal to, you know, be in the classroom or be in the trenches, as I've said to a lot of people, you know, being right there, getting my hands dirty. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I don't want to lose touch. You know, I don't want to forget what it's like to be in a classroom, to be surrounded by 30 plus kids that need your constant attention. So, um, you know, I, I think I think that it's important to, to keep that connection and, and to keep um, some authenticity to what I do. Absolutely. Now, speaking of being connected and being authentic, I think that really fits in well to the unconference model. Now, as a supporter of that, why should teachers attend a local unconference if they've never been to one? You know, it's funny. I I can't seem to make it through any type of training, no matter what I, I, I'm teaching on or facilitating, without mentioning Ed Camp. They're sort of spreading like wildfire right now in Texas, and um, I'm I'm such a huge fan. You know, the first Ed Camp that I went to was Ed Camp Dallas, which was around this time last year was the first one that I ever attended and I was immediately hooked. I mean, it, it's such a great opportunity for, for teachers and any type of educator to get their hands dirty, to, to go in and really experience um, learning that they want um, that is participant driven learning. And um, you just, it, you know, when you walk away, you feel like you've been to the best professional development you've ever been to. And it was totally unplanned. And um, there's there's such a beauty in that, that, you know, it's discussion driven. You find out what you want to. It levels the playing field between the presenters and the participants. You know, we're not walking around with our fancy, hey, I'm a presenter badge. And, um, you know, everyone is just sort of open to trying new things. And it's just it's just a great experience. And, you know, we sort of keep keep the vendors away as well. and um, keep it just focused on the learning and making a difference in the classroom. So um, I'm just really um, honored to be a part of, of those and keep trying to dip my hands into as many as, as people will let me be a part of. Where you are, uh, you're an organizer of EdCamp Awesome. Is that different from other types of EdCamps or is that one specific event that is just happens to be an EdCamp? It's one specific event that is an ed camp that we have organized that is just um, northeast of the Dallas area in a city called Royce City, Texas. And um, so I have several friends that are co-organizers of that as well. And I'm actually helping with another one sort of in this not too far from that area in Commerce, Texas, called Ed Camp Palooza. And that one is coming up in November, just in next month. So. That sounds exciting, and you can't go wrong when you use Palooza in the title of anything. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It, we, we, we promise that um, there will be lots of fun in store and lots of learning. As there, as there should be. Now, what advice do you have for maybe a first-time attendee? If you know, I'm a teacher and I keep hearing about these ed camps, what should I expect or what can you, teach, what can, what, what can you impart on me? Well, I usually explain the whole concept to, to, to newbies, you know, what it is. Um, I use Kristen Swanson's videos a lot um, to help explain it. And, um, you know, I just, you walk in and there is no set schedule. And for some people that's kind of scary, but, you know, you just write down what you want to learn that day and you write down what you're willing to facilitate. And I always use that word very specifically that you just have to be willing to facilitate a conversation. And if you are a teacher, you can facilitate a conversation about anything, even if you're not an expert in it. So I don't want people to be intimidated by that, you know, that have never presented in front of people before. You know, often we try to encourage people who've never attended an ed camp to put their name down as a possible facilitator for certain topics. 
And, um, you know, I've had a few freak outs um, over that and, and tried to help some people. And sometimes, you know, I just offer to be in the room and to be that support because it is a little bit intimidating just walking into a room. The first ed camp that I attended um, that did happen to me a little bit, I, I got chosen to facilitate the session on all things Google. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can't cover everything Google in an hour. So um, it was, you know, I, I had to facilitate a discussion to find out what did the audience need out of that. So I always use my own example of, hey, you know, I just had to step out there and I told everybody I was an Ed Camp virgin. <laughs> and <laughs> here we go. And, um, you know, so it's just um, being open. And I think once you just get your feet wet and you give it a try, you're not only addicted, but you, you become comfortable because it's a conversation. It's it's not, hey, I'm delivering a keynote type of thing. It's just, you know, hey, I, I teach every day. I can teach in front of teachers too. So I, I couldn't agree more. And I always also, I, I like to tell people, you know, bring a friend. Don't, don't go to this thing alone. Great idea. Absolutely. Now you've presented at, whether it's an unconference or more traditional conferences, you've presented on a wide variety of topics. What is your favorite topic to present about? That's a tough one. Let's see. Um, it seems these days I do a whole lot of Google, and I am very passionate about about Google and, and using Google Apps in education. That's what I'm teaching today, as a matter of fact, and um, facilitating a little introduction to Google Apps and just like to um, introduce participants to – to the ideas of supporting the learning with these tools. I always want to focus on, you know, what are your learning goals? I don't necessarily want it to be the ooh and the ah kind of presentation of, oh, here's a bunch of tools that I'm not going to tell you how these are going to benefit students at all. We're just going to, we're just going to, you know, wow you. Um, I definitely want to make sure that whatever I'm doing ties back to the learning and that we're always putting the focus on the students and getting the technology in the hands of students instead of teachers. So, um, you know, I, tr I try to, to build that in into every opportunity that I get. And, and sometimes they are more tool focused than I like. But, um, you know, I, like today, I'm talking about Google Apps and there are so many practical applications for the various and, and very numerous tools that we have inside the Google Apps domain. So um, I don't know that I have a favorite, so I don't know that I answered your question, but but I, I, I do. I just want to um, to focus on the learning and someday I hope that we will we will stop calling it digital learning or, you know, integrating technology that it's just going to be synonymous with learning. It's part of everything that we do. Along those lines, I'm waiting for the the for us to lose the term 21st century learning. I mean, it's, it's 2014 already. I mean, we're here. Well, we do have another, what, 86 years left. So, um, yeah, you know, I think we, we get caught up in the buzzwords and, and as educators and, and I guess probably in every profession, there are, there are buzzwords and acronyms for everything that become the hot words. And so everybody's searching for what's, what's the next gen going to be. And, yeah, I, I too am tired of 21st, but it, it does end up coming out every now and again. Now, along the lines of tools, besides what you use personally, what are some things that you like to recommend to teachers? And you can go wherever you want with that. Okay, I I, I definitely like to uh, try to keep things in the free realm at, at, as much as possible. You know, I, I deal with a lot of different groups of teachers and a lot of times I have groups from different districts, so they don't have necessarily the same requirements. So I definitely try to stick to free. Um, I try to stick to web-based when I can so that things work on multiple devices. And for BYOD, I, I love apps like Padlet is one of my favorites. I use that one in a lot of different settings with teachers it's very flexible. It's a great place to collect assignments, especially when students are creating things in different places, when they've been given choice and some are creating, you know, slideshows and some are making glocksters and some are make, making thing links and things like that. So um, and then, of course, you can facilitate discussion and post questions and things like that. So Padlet, I use quite a bit. I do a lot of um, iOS 
types of training as well. So specifically geared, that does seem to be particularly popular still at the moment with our districts that have, um, you know, they're still buying iPads. So um, I do a lot of iOS apps. Telegami is one that I end up sharing and using quite a bit. And the other apps that I like to talk about, obviously, um, I'm a Google girl. So I, I do a lot of Google apps for the iPad types of apps, too. I post a lot about using Google on the iPad because that is sometimes a little bit tricky <laughs> to get things to cooperate. You know, those two worlds don't always work well together, but um, I, I do try to try to use those when I can. And I try to get um, teachers on social media in whatever medium that is. So I, I'm always trying to find ways to connect with teachers and give them ways that they can connect with each other and learn from each other. Very awesome. Now, again, you, you've been so gracious with your time. So I, I know you're on your lunch break and, and you are actively presenting today. I had come across you and I found you through Zite, as I had mentioned in my email, that I read your post on your site, 10 Epic Tools That You Can't Live Without over on shakeuplearning.com. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing over there on your site and your blog. The blog has been a lot of fun. I really did not know what what path that was going to lead me towards. But um, I felt like I needed to walk the walk. You know, I'm, I'm talking to teachers and telling them that they should blog. But every time I started one, I would end up, you know, giving up. It wasn't what I wanted it to be. So I finally, you know, sort of made a resolution back in January of this year and said, I'm doing it. I'm really going to do it. I'm going to post it at least once a week. So I just set those goals for myself. And what my goal is, is just to to make it a, a resource for teachers to try to make things as easy as possible to help explain things, to help answer a lot of the questions that I get when I, you know, work with teachers, common questions and to just give them a little, you know, some tips and tricks along the way. So that has been my goal. And I have ended up ended up becoming quite addicted to blogging myself. I really enjoy it. I enjoy the design side of it, the technical side of it, and the writing and, and just getting the feedback and connecting with other educators. And I think that is the part that has really blown me away is the the amount of people that I have met just because they have connected to my blog and, you know, left a comment or connected with me on Google Plus or Twitter or whatever. And um, so it has it has been a big game changer for me, actually. I'm I'm really excited and 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 really have a lot of fun with um, the different things that I've been doing on there. I, I can't disagree. I mean, as, as I said, I, f I found one article through Zite and then I've, I've read a whole bunch of articles on your site. And I mean, it, as someone who's a graphic designer and I like to do the web stuff myself, I mean, it, it's visually appealing. Your icon is awesome. Um, the colors are great. And the article that I first read, I, I mean, I read about Digo and I, I don't even know if that's how you say it. <laughs> um, that's how I say it. <laughs> okay. So, so I'll go with that. I, I, I read the little blurb about Digo. And I'm, I, I'd heard of it. And because of your article, I'm actually going to be looking forward to actually starting and using it and trying it and, you know, exploring what that can do for me. Yeah, I love Digo. There's so many things that you can do with it. And in terms of, you know, just having a, a social bookmarking tool, even if you don't care about the social aspects of it, the annotation tools that are available for students and teachers just really can't be beat. That's what I'm looking forward to learning more about. So Casey Bell, thank you for coming and being on the House of EdTech. Uh, I'm glad you took some time to share a little bit about yourself and all the great things that you're doing. How can people now get in touch with you and pick your brain? What's acceptable? <laughs> well, um, you can find multiple ways to connect with me on my blog um, on shakeuplearning.com. I'm shakeuplearning on Twitter, and um, I have both Shakeup Learning and Casey Bell on Google Plus and LinkedIn. So um, lots of different ways. Feel free to leave me a comment or um, use the contact form on on my website. I'm happy to connect with anyone who, who would like to connect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Casey. Thanks, Chris. I enjoyed it.
And now for my EdTech thought. And today's EdTech thought was inspired by Ross Cooper. Ross Cooper blogs at his website, rosscoops31.com. He's an elementary assistant principal in the Williamsport area. And recently he posted a blog post uh, on October 6th titled with the question, would you want to be a teacher in your district? And these are the questions that Ross raises in his post. Number one, are students the focal point of all decisions? Number two, will I be supported? Number three, in general, will my administrators stress empowerment more than accountability? Number four, will my unique talents be appreciated? Number five, are ideas separated from their sources? Number six, will I be allowed to constructively criticize? Number seven, is there a fear of forward-thinking technology integration? Number eight, is the culture driven by standardized testing? Number nine, will I have control over my own professional learning? Number 10, will administration support the click or the cultivators? Number 11, Am I inspired to a growth mindset or drawn in by a fixed mindset? And the last question he poses, does the district seem to always operate in a top-down, one-size-fits-all approach, or is leadership owned by many? Now, when I read this, I gathered quickly that the post is more geared towards administrators and would they want to be a teacher in their own district. But I also kind of look at it as, You know, when you work in your district and you go out and you talk about what you do and the fact that you're a teacher, would you want other people to come into your district? That that's kind of the spin that that I take on it. And when I look at some of these questions, the answers are pretty surprising. I don't know if every teacher everywhere feels supported when they want to be creative and do the things that are best for children. Now I know in many places The mission statement will tell you, you know, it's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. But I'll I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it is not about the kids in any way, shape, or form other than what's printed on the piece of paper or on the letterhead. One of the questions, is culture driven by standardized testing? Culture is definitely driven by standardized testing in so many places. And it's also so wrong. To quote the what's here in, in the article, uh, with more and more accountability being driven by student performance on standardized tests, is the school culture driven to raise test scores to play this game? Or is there a genuine culture to improve student achievement? And, and I'm not that I'm lying, but I'm going to say, you know, I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of places where it, it's all about teaching to the test and it's not about authentic learning. And, and that has to be key. Uh, some other takeaways I had from this, uh, this post by Ross, um, Am I inspired to a growth mindset or drawn in by a fixed mindset? Uh, my mind goes a mile a minute when I'm talking with my colleagues and, you know, I have all these ideas, but, you know, it, it, sometimes it gets to administration or even just, it, it doesn't even, it can't even leave the conversation with the teacher because, you know, the culture is just so, it, it just beats you down sometimes depending on where you are. And I know that you'll agree that, you know, sometimes and in many districts, it is very top down. It's not a team effort. It's uh, it might be might be your superintendent. It might just be your principal, and and everything is you know just kind of pushed down on you. It's not right. The best school districts seem to have a more unified team approach. And I know I mean when you get into you know contract negotiations and and labor agreements between unions and and districts, sure yes that stuff is messy, but that's not what this is about. It's about what are we doing on a day to day basis for our students. And, 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 you know, where do the ideas come from? If, if we go back to one of the other questions, which is, you know, do we separate? Are you acknowledged? That do, can people be separated, you know, from their ideas, for separated from the sources? That's what the question says. Is everyone allowed to voice their opinions regardless of their position, you know, and or experience? And personally, I'm hard pressed in my own experience where my ideas have been appreciated. I'm not saying people have stolen my ideas. I'm just saying, you know, ideas are sometimes hard to get off the ground. I I don't want to ramble about this, but I I think you get the idea of, you know, where I'm going with this. So I do recommend, and I'll put a link to the show notes that you kind of check out 
all these questions that were posted by Ross Cooper. Again, his website is rosscoops31.com. I am inspired by this EdTech thought to continue and not give up hope that my voice matters. And I guess that's really the point. You know, does your voice matter? And how can you make your voice matter? So actually, I think that's a nice way to wrap up the thought. So continue to speak and speak appropriately. Be persistent, be positive, and you can make a difference on a professional level. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And now for this episode's EdTech recommendation. For this episode, I'd like to recommend an awesome, awesome, super awesome, I don't know how many times I could say awesome, awesome app for your iPad called TouchCast. T-O-U-C-H-C-A-S-T. TouchCast, basically here's what it is. It's video and the web coming together. You can now experience both like never before with TouchCast. It's a new medium that looks like video, but feels more like a website or a web page. A TouchCast video is a fully browsable, responsible piece of media. I'm sorry, not responsible, responsive piece of media. <laughs> um, web pages, images, uh, and, a, and an assembly of video apps called VAPs, VAPs, can be tapped for a two way video experience. And what I like about it is that basically TouchCast is a TV studio in your hands. You can create legitimately broadcast quality videos and include tools like a built in teleprompter, green screen effects, visual filters, sound effects, and really awesome lower thirds. You can watch TouchCasts from the app, or you can go online to touchcast.com. And their mission is simple. Directly from their website, it's to bring the wonder of the web to video, and they're trying to usher in a new age of expression. Anybody, and really anybody, can easily create professional quality videos that finally behave like the rest of the web. Um, one of the more exciting applications I've seen of this is by Brad Gustafson. Brad is on Twitter at Gustafson B, G U S T A F S O N, the letter B on Twitter. And he uses TouchCast to produce his video podcast called hashtag 30 second take. Uh, obviously I'm going to link to Brad's show in the show notes and you do need to check it out. And if you don't get it in iTunes, you can also check out uh, 30 second take on Sunday nights at about eight o'clock ish, uh, Eastern time on teachercast.tv where Jeff Bradbury airs the 30 second take following the tech educator podcast, uh, again on teachercast.tv. Now I've been playing with the app for over a month and it's awesome. Um, I've used it with my building principal for back to school night video and she was super happy with it. And thought I was this amazing person. And I told her, I was like, no, it's, it's really, it's not me normally doing the awesome tech stuff. This app is just, you know, really awesome. And she was actually more excited to go home and show it to her own high school age son and, and get him using the app because her own son is very much into technology. So you have to check out TouchCast. And I actually just found out before I sat down to record this that, um, you can now also download and test a desktop version of TouchCast which I haven't played with yet, but I am looking forward to doing that in the next couple of days and, you know, see what I can create. So go check out TouchCast. And now let's meet this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to Alice Keeler. Alice is a passionate educator who believes that professional development is not always formally delivered. Alice is a technology missionary on a quest to inspire and help teachers to try something new. More than idea sharing, she works with teachers to make vision reality. She will not settle for the status quo. There is always a better way something can be done and technology can make it happen. She is passionate about student learning, understanding, and being able to apply their learning. Alice is interested in applying gaming principles to education, to increase motivation, and to meet each student where they are by customizing their learning experience 
to help them achieve their maximum potential. I couldn't agree with her principles and philosophy anymore. So you need to connect with Alice Keeler. She is on Twitter. Her username is Alice Keeler, A L I C E K E E L E R. And she can also be found online at her website, alicekeeler.com. Congratulations, Alice. You are the House of Ed Tech VIP. And real quick, before we close out this episode of the House of Ed Tech, I have a couple of education conferences I'd like to pass along to you. First, we have on Saturday, December 6th and Saturday, December 13th, uh, 2014, we have the Google Educator Certification Bootcamp. Uh, this was sent in by Billy Krakauer at W. Krakauer on Twitter. This is being presented by Evolving Educators, LLC, and Kiker Learning, LLC. This is an entire workshop that'll be taught by Rich Kiker, who is a uh, former House of EdTech VIP and nationwide, nationally recognized Google Apps for Education trainer. This whole experience is to have participants ready to take the five online exams in order to achieve Google Educator status. For more information, visit their S'more page at s'more.com slash SZVR9. And there'll be a link to that and all of these in the show notes. Coming up on Saturday, October 18th, 2014, there is the Edscape Conference at New Milford High School, the former school of award-winning principal Eric Scheninger, and the cost is only $35. Head over to edscapeconference.com for more information, and there is still time to register. Thank you to Eric for sending that my way, and I'm happy to plug that for you, pal. Also coming up, we have the EdCamp New Jersey Conference on Saturday, November 22nd. Um, more than 500 educators from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and beyond will be coming to Linwood Middle School. I'm really excited. This will be my second year attending personally. And if you're in the area or you want to come to the area, this is a fantastic unconference that you can definitely get a lot out of. Uh, check out the website, edcampnj.org, and also check them out on Twitter. And the username is edcampnj. I'm really excited because I found out that Teresa Steger, principal from the Midwest, is coming to New Jersey for the conference. She was previously on the podcast in episode 12, and I'm excited to meet her because she is another one-third of the formerly principal cast, now principal PLN podcast crew. I got to meet Spike in August at Teach Meet NJ, and I'm excited to meet Teresa and take another selfie. Um, also, Conference t-shirts are being sold for this event, and 100% of the profit, well, there is no profit, 100% of the money is being donated to the National Breast Cancer Foundation, and we are selling these t-shirts through the website teespring.com, and you can head over to teespring, T-E-E, spring.com slash edcampnj2014. Check out the shirts. They're really cool. Pick up a couple. All the money goes to a great cause, and... I hope to uh, see you there. And the last one I'd like to uh, mention again is EdTech NJ, which will take place on Saturday, January 31st. For updates, go to edtechnj.com and follow EdTech NJ on Twitter. All right, DJ, cue that music because that's going to do it for this episode of House of EdTech. As always, I am Christopher Nessie. Keep the conversation going and check out the new website where you can get the show notes, and that is mr.chrisnessy.com. Again, this is episode number 21. I would love your feedback, and there are a number of ways that you can do that. You can leave a comment on the show notes for the episode. You can also leave audio feedback, which I'd love to start getting some more of. Click the speak pipe button on the website. You can also call the House of EdTech listener feedback line at 732 732- 903-4869. You can also connect with me on Voxer. My username is cnessie4602. And you can also email me, feedback at chrisnessie.com. And I'm also on Twitter. And the username is Mr. Nessie, M-R-N-E-S-I. 
and just use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. Now, if you enjoy the House of Ed Tech, I'd like you to help me out and go over to iTunes or Stitcher, or both, and rate and review the podcast. Your five-star rating and positive review helps to keep the program front and center for others to discover and enjoy. I'm also coming up on the one-year anniversary of podcasting personally and the birthday of the House of EdTech podcast. For episode 26, I've decided I'd like to turn the show over to you. Episode 26 is going to feature the first annual House of EdTech app smackdown. I'd like to feature 26 tools, apps, and websites. While you could email me your contribution, I'd really like to provide audio. So send me feedback through the hotline or speaker or the other ways that you can send audio feedback. Also, be sure to let me know some more information about yourself. Tell me your name, where you're from, your website, your blog. If you have a podcast, brag about yourself. Let me know who you are. I'd love to include it. Be sure to check out episode number 22 which I'll be releasing on October 26th, 2014, when I share my conversation with Derek Larson, a fourth grade teacher from Utah. Thank you for listening. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try.